Hey everybody, welcome back for Volcanoes Part 2, also known as Volcanoes B, um, it, which still has nothing to do with the planet Vulcan. Uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to review a little bit the types of magma and type of volcano. Today we're really going to get into hazards that happen with a volcano. Everybody always thinks of lava, and some people may even think of volcanic lightning, um, because of movies where they have thunderstorms starting as, as your volcano is dramatically erupting in the background. Uh, some people might think of the gas that comes out, but there really is a lot more than you could potentially think about. Some people may have been already interested in volcanoes and maybe went on YouTube and looked up volcanic hazards, in which case you would have seen a lot of really interesting videos. Some of them probably worrisome, um, but the other ones you'd probably be like, oh wow, that's so cool. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So again, quick review, types of magma, you have basalt, which generally forms your darker types of rock. Uh, basalt will form your uh, normal black sands beaches at Hawaii. It will form the stereotypical uh, black lava rock that people tend to see. Andesite is your middle one. They tend to be a grayish color. And then rhyolite is going to be your, your most silica rich magma, the slowest magma, the most sticky, the most explosive. That one's going to be a nice pink color. Uh, your types of volcano are your strata or composite volcano, uh, which remember is your weird layer cake. It's the iconic pointy mountain volcano. Uh, your shield volcano, which our big example for that was Hawaii uh, in Mauna Loa, where it literally looks like a, a shield that's on its side. Your scoria cone, which is like a big pile of sand. And then your fissure volcano, which was essentially just a crack in the earth. Okay. Uh, right now we're going to talk about different types of eruptions. You have effusive, which means they're not really going to be explosive at all. Uh, the most well-known effusive eruption is the Hawaiian eruption, which we've talked about earlier a little bit, and we're going to talk about more today. This is what's going to lead to your iconic shield volcanoes. And then we have our explosive eruptions, uh, like the Strombolian, the Vulcanian, Plinian, Phreatomagmatic, um, and this tends to lead to your stratovolcanoes and your scoria cones. Effusive volcanism is determined by the lava type and amount of gas. Um, effusive eruptions, which lead to shield volcanoes, um, are, are primarily gas poor, meaning that maybe there's no gas in the system, which is not very likely, or more likely that your magma is not sticky, so it doesn't hold onto the gas, meaning that it escapes. Okay, and that's where you're going to have your Hawaiian style eruptions. Uh, the more gas that you add, the bigger the eruption becomes, or the height of the eruption column in increases, and so does the explosiveness. So our next level is Strombolian. Strombolian is going to have some gas. Uh, it'll more look like a plug, or in some cases a slug, like what you have in a shotgun. Um, that'll come up and push out a whole bunch of lava at once, creating this really pretty looking eruption. Um, the reason it's called Strombolian is because it tends to be found in, it, it's found, it's, most well known at the volcano known as Stromboli, uh, which is in Stromboli, Italy, where Strombolis come from. <laughs> um, and so that one's got going to have a very short eruption column. It's not going to be very high, but it's going to be very pretty and bright, and it can actually happen on a pretty uh, uh, um, time-dependent basis. It tends to have a, a time limit between each eruption. Uh, and so then we get to subplinian, ultraplinian, and we have volcanian, Sertsian, and phreatoplinian. And you'll notice that the column itself gets taller, um, and the amount that seems to be coming out of it gets bigger. The cloud gets bigger. Effusive or Hawaiian eruptions usually have very hot fluid magmas. There are some scoria because of lava fountains uh, where you're going to have either high pressure or you'll have a little bit of of lava getting a little bit of gas getting trapped and causing it to come out um, if you want to see the lava fountain I have this YouTube video here for you guys to watch um, it is not restricted to Hawaii lava fountains are also known as fire fountains and they can be found all over the world most of the time these come from a single vent or fissure um, and they tend to be very non-violent because the magma is very fluid it's not very sticky or viscous these also pour, form pillow basalts when they form at the bottom of the ocean since they tend to form over shield volcanoes. So let's see if we can get this to open. Okay, so here's our, our lava fountain video. 
Uh, we're actually going to be in Iceland. Iceland has a ton of eruptions because uh, it's it's actually right on the mid-ocean ridge. So we have spreading there and we have a lot of fissures going on. And so what we can see right here is a very nice example of a um, fissure eruption or Hawaiian style eruption where we have these lava fountains coming through and they're really beautiful. And again, a lot of times it has to do sometimes with pressure pushing it out and other times with gas causing it to come out. Uh, so here we have some visual examples. This is a lava lake. Again, they're going to have more fluid magmas. It's going to be very hot. Um, it's, it's going to be less sticky. And lava lakes are really, really cool. And people don't really understand why they form. We just know that they do. And it's a lake of lava. And it's really great because if they haven't done this, where they've breached the sides uh, or the dam-like structure that's keeping it in the lake and comes out, you can get a lot of really interesting samples from that. And then here's lava fountains at Piton de Fornes in La Reunion Island. Um, and so now let's go down to our, our Strombolian volcano. And Strombolian volcanoes are also going to be basalts. They're also very fluid, but more explosive than Hawaiian, mostly because there's more gas in the system. Again, it's going to be from a singular vent, and eruptions usually occur in regular intervals. Uh, let's take Stromboli, Italy. 30-minute uh, intervals and the eruptions tend to be restricted to the crater, so ejecta don't travel far. Um, and this is actually a huge tourist attraction in Italy, so much so that uh, Stromboli, the volcano, has been given the nickname of the lighthouse of the Mediterranean. So let's go ahead and watch that. Okay, so here we're going to be seeing a Strombolian eruption. Uh, Strombolian eruptions are really, really pretty, especially at night. Here we're going to see in the daytime. You'll know it's coming from right here. You can see a little bit of orange in there with the sunlight hitting it. And you see all this material being thrown out. That's the cooled magmatic material. That's the tephra that happens. And then this is all ash. And you can see it doesn't actually go very far from the vent. And it helps build up what the vent is. And since some of it is still, in fact, molten, it does stick, forming these really cool edifices. So now let's find one for more nighttime related. This won't work. You can see how really pretty and bright that is, and you can see why people would love watching it. This is something that we tend to see, again, in Stromboli. It's a huge tourist attraction for those in Stromboli. Um, and you'll notice that it is, it's happening very generally, regularly. Um, it's a pretty big poof of an explosion where you just have a lot of material come out, and then it's done. That's it. Um, and it just helps consistently build up the vent around the volcano, the, where the material is coming out, constantly making it bigger and bigger. And since it is wet, it is still molten when it pops out, only some of it being hard, it does cause a build up of material. Um, all right, so Vulcanian. Vulcanian are a little bit bigger. These are going to be either andesite or rhyolite magmas. Remember, andesite, like I said in the beginning, form the gray volcanic rocks that we see. They're going to have more silica. They're going to be a little bit more sticky. These are going to be along the lines of warm, warm, warm honey, cool honey, uh, cool honey, not warm honey. And rhyolite magmas are going to be more like your chunky peanut butter. They're going to have the most silica, so they're going to be the most viscous. Uh, these are much more explosive than Hawaiian eruptions, and material that gets e thrown out of the volcano are blocks as well as highly fragmented smaller pieces like ash and tephra. Uh, these will form large ash plumes with blocks that will rise several kilometers above the crater. Ash and scoria is due to fragmentation of the magma due to gas. So remember how when we saw the Strombolian eruption, pieces were flying out of the crater. The same thing happens here. And as they get fragmented, which is when it gets essentially ripped apart, um, instead of coming out as a sheet, uh, they cool really quickly and form those little tiny pieces. Uh, so ash and scoria, again, is due to that fragmentation or ripping apart of the lava as it comes out. At the base of the eruption, we're going to have a jet which is down here. Let me see if I can get my laser pointer. Here's our jet phase. Okay, it's going to be where everything's shooting straight up. Um, this is where the bombs and blocks are going to be thrown from. And at the top, we have our convective phase where it looks really fluffy. Uh, this is where we're going to have rising due to convection, meaning it's really, really hot, so it's going to go up, and then the density is lower because of the heat. So here we have two videos that don't seem to be showing up. So we're going to go ahead and put them up on YouTube instead. 
All right, here we're going to be looking at a couple of different types of volcanic eruptions. Uh, we'll notice right away when the when the vent happens, but here we're actually going to see something cool. We're going to see what happens when sound gets to you slower than what you see, just like with lightning. All right, so there's our jet phase, and now we're having the convective phase. What you can see moving is the sound as it's about to hit, and you'll notice because they're going to rock a little bit, but we see all this material getting thrown out. Uh, this is a quite a big distance from where we are where this is happening. So those are some blocks. Uh, this was Papua New Guinea. Uh, so now let's take a look at this volcanic eruption in Japan. Um, again, we see our jet phase and our convective phase happening. You see it doesn't get very tall. Um, we have material just being thrown out. And you can see how when it hits, it causes debris to just poof up. Those are some pretty big rocks. We also had a little bit of a collapse in a pyroclastic density current. And our, oh, we saw that one already. Next is our Plinian eruption, which is going to have a lot of gas. Okay, there's going to be a lot of gas in a Plinian eruption. They are highly viscous, so very silica-rich andesite and rhyolite magmas. Uh, because the magma is so sticky, these gases can't escape. Remember, we were talking about blowing bubbles in honey and blowing bubbles in peanut butter and how they don't escape very well, um, leading to that ripping apart of the magma and an explosive eruption. Uh, these are characterized by large volumes of fragmented volcanic material and gas being ejected tens of kilometers into the atmosphere. They get pretty high. And you're still going to have that jet phase that jet phase and convective phase, and it kind of makes like a little bit of a mushroom cloud look to it. All this material that comes out, all this what looks like poof, uh, is really going to be ash, and that's part of things being ripped apart. Because it's so viscous, as it rips apart, it rips up into fragments that are so tiny, that's super cool, that we get ash. And this is, I know a lot of people think, ash, fire. It's not fire. It's very, very tiny fragments of rock. Definitely not something you want to breathe in. Um, Plinian eruptions are named for Pliny the, El the Younger. Remember the first guy who we deem as a volcanologist who described Pompeii in 79 AD. Uh, these are very large and very dangerous eruptions, and they will trigger global changes due to the amount of ash and gas that they actually throw into the atmosphere, meaning they can drop the temperature for a year or so by maybe, I think, tops a degree or two Celsius. Um, the bigger the eruption, the more material coming out, the more of a change it will cause because ash is very, very, very light. So it tends to stay in our atmosphere. And when you get stuff like ash in the atmosphere, it kind of blocks the sun a little bit, causing global cooling. Uh, so when you have just one eruption like this happening, it's not going to make a big difference. It may cause some cooling in the general area, but it may not be like super impactful around the globe in the way that you are now thinking, where you're thinking, oh no, ice age due to a volcano erupting. No. But it may change the temperature just, just slightly. Like we might have a cooler summer one year because we had a, a very massive Plinian eruption. These also have a high chance of something called a pyroclastic density current, which is this guy right here which is essentially when this becomes too heavy and collapses, causing a lot of hot gas and ash to just whoom, down the side of a mountain. They move very quickly and they're very dangerous. All right, plenty of eruptions. Again, it's going to be bigger than a volcano eruption. It's going to have a much bigger um, jet phase. Let's take a look at Mount St. Helens. Again, this was one of the volcanoes we thought was dormant and it turns out, it, or extinct, and it turns out it was just sleeping, it was just dormant. Here we can see this is the jet phase and all the way up here that's kind of cut off is the top of what we would look at as kind of like a little bit of a mushroom cloud. Um, and we'll actually see a little bit of this. There are some videos that were taken in 1980. You can definitely see this convective phase right up here as it starts. Uh, the top of the convective phase will always go to one side due to wind pushing it away. So let's go ahead and see what we can get. Here we go. We can see that this is a ton of material getting thrown out. And it did end up going down the side of the mountain as it collapsed some, causing a huge PDC. Um, and there were, this was actually due to a flank eruption. A lot of it caused, was caused by a flank eruption where the eruption actually went sideways. Um, 
kind of ruining the pretty the pretty picturesque Mount St. Helens after. Now let's move forward. There's another eruption here I want you guys to see. Here we are. Alright, so now we are in Tongaruha. Um, this is another Plinian eruption that we're going to see, and we'll see just how much material comes out of this volcano. You can see how far we are away. There was our jet phase. And you'll notice as the material gets to us, and that was pretty quick that happened over time. Back to this. Okay, and then we have phreatomagmatic. Uh, this means that we have water being involved in the eruption, or when water gets into the vent where our eruption is happening. These are very, 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 very explosive. Uh, they have cypressoid plumes, meaning we have multiple colors, so you're going to have black and white. Um, your, your, your white is going to be steam from water being super evaporated super quickly. Um, and then this, is, the black part is going to be the actual, uh, like, ash and debris that comes out of the volcano. Uh, one type is the Circean, which is this one right here, which is named so because of Circe Island. Um, and these type actually form in the ocean themselves. And they are associated with basaltic magmas, usually because they're formed by hotspots. They'll have columns of more or less 20 kilometers, and regular phreatomagmatic eruptions will have 40 kilometer high, high plumes. Um, some produce lapilli, but mostly a lot of gas, and these cause pyroclastic surges, fine ash, and are very dangerous to be around because very, things that are very explosive tend not to be good for humans or life in general. Uh, you are going to have a lot of gas happening because as soon as, think, think of having a hot pan with oil in it. If your oil is really, really hot and you put a drop of water in there, that water is going to cause a crack and you're going to get splattered with some oil. The same thing happens with magma and, and lava. Like, it's hot. It's really hot. Hundreds of degrees Celsius to thousands of degrees Celsius. If you put cold water on that, it's going to... Okay, and instead of just having a pop and you're now covered with maybe some spattering of magma, which hurts. Um, I don't know this from personal experience, but can you imagine how oil hurts? Imagine how, how lava would feel. Um, you would also get some of this fragmenting really finely and you'd get gas, ash. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be so fun. Let's go ahead and watch this video that we have here. I'm Jonathan Proper, CEO of Drops.com, and I'm here to give you the naked truth about Long In Italy, tourists and journalists hoping for a better look at Europe's most active volcano ran for their lives today. An explosion sent ash, rocks, and steam their way at temperatures over 1,800 degrees. More from Rome correspondent Seth Dome. Mount Etna has been putting on an impressive show for days, spewing lava and steam, but no... So we have our white plumes of steam because we have all this ice here. And a lot of these people should not be here, but you can see the black and the white, the ash and the steam clouds. Um, these people actually got really hurt. Do not stand near the edifice of an active volcano. It's not the wisest thing to do. Um, we get to see at the bottom how these people actually had tephra falling down on them, which the tephra, I know it looks hard and it's cooled, but um, those materials that are coming out are still quite hot to touch and they not be melting, but they're hot. And when they get on you, they will burn you like this poor person was. Um, so yeah, this is an example of a phreatomagmatic eruption where there was ice at the edifice and it melted, got in and caused a phreatomagmatic eruption. But yeah, this is the kind of damage it could do to your coat. Imagine what it'll do to you like this guy's face. Okay. It is not wise to be this close to an active volcanic edifice. Word of warning. Okay, so how does an eruption work? I keep talking about um, how much gas is involved. Or I, I tried to, to hint at this. Um, and there's different types, but most of the time, remember I said it's like blowing bubbles into honey or um, cold honey or, or peanut butter. Think of it as bubbles of gas. So what are these bubbles? This is bubbles. Um, so there are different eruption types because of this, but when we think of a bubbly eruption, we think of champagne. There is more gas than magma, and generally the magma is pretty fluid, allowing the gas to escape, 
this leads to an effusive volcano versus when your magma is really sticky and it holds onto the gas and it causes a more, um, like I said, explosive eruption. So based on the type and viscosity of the magma depends on how you're going to have gas escaping. So in this case, we have bubbly. Okay, think of like soda water, seltzers, anything that really has bubbles. If you shake it, the bubbles escape and you get foam, right? Um, and that's really what happens when you have an effusive volcano. When you have a slug, you're going to have a Strombolian explosion. It's more along the gas bubbles will, will come together. Just like when you put water droplets together, you get a bigger water droplet. When gas bubbles come together, you get a bigger gas bubble. In this case, it forms like a slug, which pushes magma up above it, causing it to fragment when it comes out, forming a Strombolian eruption. And then you have annular, that means the gas is kind of pushing the magma to the side as it pushes up, bringing the magma up with it, forming your fire fountains. And then you have dispersed, where each of these bubbles is actually magma, and all around it is gas. And there's so much gas that it kind of brings up little blebs of magma with it, forming our Plinian and Ultraplinian eruptions. Things that come out of a volcano. We have lava, ash, scoria, and bombs. Look at that. Doesn't that look cool? It looks like it's about to transform into something like an alien or, or a transformer. Yeah. So lava flows. There's two types of lava flow that we really talk about, and that is the pohoho flow and the aa -ah flow. Pohoho is uh, what a lot of people think of, the smooth lava flows that happen. These are, very, these are both named because of Hawaii. They're both actually the Hawaiian language, but this one's going to be smooth where af after it's cooled completely and you walk on it, it's going to feel smooth. Um, whereas your ah ah flows, when you walk at them, it's easy to remember. When you walk on them, you go ah ah because they're actually quite sharp. This one is a very dry magma and it tends to be very crumbly even as it's flowing. Uh, lava domes is the accumulation of our stickier lava, so it has greater than 55% silica, super duper duper stick, okay? Um, forms around a fixed vent. Uh, here we have Colima in Mexico. This is the crater and we have a dome actually forming inside. It kind of looks like a very burnt marshmallow, if you think about it that way. Um, your slopes are generally going to be about 30 degrees or less, and you get different shapes and growth rates. Uh, usually you find them on top of stratovolcanoes and they will collapse eventually. Okay, Generally they'll collapse eventually um, and actually cause PDCs to happen. So as they break apart and fall in on themselves, a PDC will form. Lava tubes are really cool. Um, for those of you who've watched Lord of the Rings, what you see inside of Mordor coming in and having those lava waterfalls into it, those are all lava tubes. Um, lava tubes are the cave-like tunnels that once served as conduits carrying magma from an active vent to the flow's leading edge. Um, they are technically underground, so technically it's magma, but we're calling it a lava flow. I don't know. Um, in some places you get skylights forming where the roof of the lava tube collapses and you can actually see inside the rivers of lava flowing through the tube and it's super duper cool. Um, they're basically tunnels. <laughs> Um, I don't recommend, should you go and take a look at one, I don't recommend ever sleeping in one because they can become active again and the only way you'll know is because you'll just happen to get a little too hot before you get lava coming down the tube. Um, they are cool. I totally recommend visiting them. There's some out in Arizona in the San Francisco Volcanic Field near Flagstaff that you can go look at. There are parks out there, so this way you can go look at all of these things. They're really, really neat. And then we get pillow, pillow lavas or pillow basalts. Um, these occur when magma is erupting through a vent underwater. Generally, these are going to be magmatic, uh, sorry, magmatic, <laughs> basaltic in nature. Um, and they're going to form on the ocean floor. I know this one looks kind of nasty, but this is what they really look like. And they kind of come out almost the same way that toothpaste does from a toothpaste thing, as if you leave it alone long enough, or if you have a caulk gun, when caulk comes out of the, the gun because it's sitting there, consistently pushing caulk out on its own. And it creates these little like poofs or pillows of, of lava. So this is, these divers essentially go down and take videos of these. So we're gonna go down and take a look. 
let's go forward here we go so you'll notice there's spots that um, these are all old lava flows under the water where the fish are currently hanging out and we're actually gonna about to go find some new spots and you'll notice because they're very bubbly because of course it's super duper hot it's instant vaporizing the water like here All right, and so here we're actually going to get to see it. This is how a pillow basalt forms, or a pillow lava. You can see that the magma behind it is con or lava behind it is pushing constantly, causing it to go further and further and further. And then we get columnar basalts. These are due to jointing, which is the result of shrinking fractures that occur as an igneous rocks cool. Um, it has to do with how they cool. So it's you're cooling slower on the outside than on the inside, causing cracking to go, and it causes shrinkage. And this this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, hexagon hexagon formation to happen. These are very famous in Ireland, and they also have some at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. If you ever go, very much recommend it. Um, and here's what it looks like with a uh, iPhone 6 Plus, okay? Um, this one is Dacite Mountain, and this one is from Randall, Washington. So you can actually still go see, you can see them in Washington State as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about pyroclasts. Um, when it comes to the lab that's going to be uh, um, combined with this lecture, where you're going to go into lab class and you're going to have a volcano-based lab, we're going to be doing this based on pictures this year because we're not in course. We're not seeing each other face to face. Um, but pyroclasts are also known as tephra. These are the things that come out of the volcano as the, the lava or magma has been ripped apart. Okay, um, When it's very, very fine or less than 2 millimeters in diameter, it is known as ash. Ash. When it is between 2 and 64 millimeters, it is known as lapilli. When it is greater than 64 millimeters and it's rounded, it's known as a bomb. When it's angular, it's known as a block. Okay. Um, scoria and pumice are two types of, of tephra that gets ejected that is considered vesicular. Vesicular means it has a bunch of holes in it. And that's just because of how much gas was in it. Pumice is unique. It is the felsic version. It's always going to be this nice, pretty white color, off-white, not entirely pure white, but it's not cream, it's kind of off-white. Um, and in this case, it has, you can see, a ton of holes in it. We use pumice for various things. If you ever go and get your nails done or your feet done, you get a pedicure, um, or your parent, your mother, or father, because some people just don't like calluses, will have a pumice block in their bathroom where they rub their heels to try to keep their heels smooth or they'll rub different calluses because it's great on breaking down calluses. Um, we also have pumice in our gardens because it's great for keeping water trapped or water flow, but pumice floats. You can drop a piece of pumice in a glass of water. I mean, I wouldn't leave it there forever because eventually all the holes will fill up and it will sink, but you can just drop it in and it will float. Pumice floats. Scoria, which is the mafic version or the darker version, it comes from more basaltic magmas, will not float. That has to do to the fact of its mag its actual composition being different. Remember, felsic, more silica rich, ma magmatic, uh, basaltic has less silica, it's going to have more iron, more magnesium, so it's actually going to be heavier. But it will also have a lot of holes in it, just like pumice does. Okay, These do not get classified as lapilli, bombs, or blocks, because they are their own classification. They are known as scoria and pumice. All right, let's talk about some hazards. We have pyroclastic density currents, also known as nuae al dente, and they are also known as PDCs. You have ash, lahars, atmospheric cooling, gases, lava, dome and flank collapse, bombs and blocks, okay? Make sure you write all of these down and study them. This is a question in your study guide. I know that for sure. Um, you will have to, it will probably be a multiple choice question where you, where I say, which of the following is a volcanic hazard? Circle all that apply. All right, so let's talk about pyroclastic density currents because PDCs are awesome. PDCs 
are can be caused by an ash col column collapse during an eruption, even a dome collapse. They're also known as pyroclastic flows. They are filled with ash, debris, hot gas. They're extremely hot and extremely fast, and you cannot outrun them. They will kill you if you if you are caught in one. Okay. They tend to flow down valleys and places where PDCs have previously flowed because it's easier and nature tends to take the easiest path. Um, and here's some videos that we're obviously not going to be able to see and that makes me sad. Um, but here we can see a column and just like I was talking about earlier, the column collapses and starts to go down. It doesn't always seem like it's going very fast and they tend to stop very abruptly you don't actually know where a pdc will stop it stops when it runs out of the energy to go forward and it actually looks like it hits a brick wall it's really really neat lahars are often called mud flows they are composed of a slurry of pyroclasts rocks and water there are varying amounts of water involved usually it only needs just enough water to flow making them mostly debris. These can be caused during an eruption and after an eruption. That's part of why lahars are a very tricky volcanic hazard. They can happen years after an eruption just because you finally have enough water for the flow to occur. It can be due to a melting glacier above a vent, heavy rains after an eruption and during an eruption. Okay, so this one we have a working video that we can use. This is a lahar. You can see it looks pretty liquidy, but in fact, it's only enough water to get between each pore that it just removes the friction. So it allows it to just flow and it's very destructive. It does a lot of property damage. It will bury your house, your car, your cow, you, not a wise place to be. Um, a lot of scientists try to predict when these happen. Uh, they know that maybe if there was a recent eruption, there's a lot of ash at the top of the volcano and there's a big rainstorm coming and they'll try to warn people, hey, we should leave the area because there's going to be a lahar. They will also follow riverbeds, but they are very easy to overflow it. Let's go to this one. This one is a grad student sitting in there. <laughs> Poor grad student. Um, and you can actually see the flow starting to come. And in this one in particular, you can see big chunks of rock being pulled down. And then we have dome and flank collapse, which again, as we described earlier, you essentially have a, a volcanic dome that just collapses and it causes a pyroclastic density current like this. Um, so this is one example of a PDC that forms. You can see how quickly it moves. It tends to go down valley paths that already exist. Again, ease of movement. They do move very quickly. They can knock down trees. That's how powerful they are. Uh, and like I said, they're super duper hot. This poor guy's trying to run. Uh, so this is the response that happens. You see these things coming, people leave. Uh, they drive away as fast as they can. Um, but this will be an example where we'll see it just stop. Okay, this camera was left behind in order to view the PDC as it happened. But you can see just how massive this is and how, like, imagine being caught in that is crazy. And just see how it just stopped. It's no longer moving forward, and that is because it's run out of energy. It's almost like it's hit a brick wall. And the point is, is that you never know when that's going to happen. All right, so now let's move on to atmospheric cooling. This is when ash is thrown into the atmosphere with gases. Uh, it has a unique effect of causing global warming. Uh, so remember, gas does come out of a volcano. We have sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Uh, there's a lot of gas being thrown up and out of a volcano, which is part of why it's actually pretty dangerous to be near an active volcanic crater edifice because you could actually get poisoned from the gas that you breathe in. Um, when enough of this gas is thrown into the atmosphere, it can cause global cooling. 
Um, ash particles that are in the atmosphere reflect sunlight, causing a sort of reflective blanket, and a large eruption can cause a drop of a few degrees Celsius. Again, something that can cause maybe a cooler summer or two or a colder winter. All right, remember, lava in most places is quite slow and is less a cause of death than a cause of property damage, okay? Um, this is a rock hammer, which is what we use to actually pick up lava and throw it in a bucket. Um, but yeah, most of the time what lava will do is not necessarily hurt people, because you can easily walk in front of lava with a camera backwards as long as you know where you're going, and you can outwalk the lava. That's how slow they tend to move. Uh, but it can impact buried infrastructure, um, and it affects society in many ways. It can cause secondary hazards like fires. They, I mean, it's hot molten rock. It will light your plants on fire and your house. <laughs> um, they will block roads. After an eruption in Iceland, for example, the heat from a lava flow was used to power new infrastructure because it stayed hot for so long. Okay, Lava flows stay hot for tens of of years, in some cases even hundreds of years. Uh, they can cover things, making them harder to access. Um, and what happens to stuff that's underneath a lava flow, like maybe a septic tank, probably doesn't survive very well. Um, bombs and blocks, like we talked about earlier, here is some for scale. This one is called a bread crust bomb uh, because it's all crackled, it looks like a bread crust. Um, this is a bomb that was pretty molten when it came out. And you can see that these are real people on top and next to them. Um, they're huge. Imagine one of those landing on you or your cow. Here is a crater left by a bomb on the left. So let's go ahead and take the laser form right here. This is a crater from a bomb. Over here is another bomb. Yeah, sometimes they'll hit and roll. So they'll leave behind their impact crater. This type one is called a bread crust bomb. It looks like the top of bread after it's um, gone and cooled and baked in the oven, crackling a little bit on top. Um, and here's some other cool things. This one's called reticulite. It's a, um, basically, it's like a, a froth or, or, or foam, lava foam. Um, it forms in high fountains where lava clots froth and burst from their bubble walls, uh, leaving behind this delicate thread-like network of glass. So these are all glass, and it's almost like foam being frozen. It's so cool. And then there's this other thing called Pele's Tear, which is another type of volcanic foam where you essentially have this really fine hair-like structures forming. Um, and it, the name of it comes from the god Pele, which was the volcano god in Hawaii. Igneous activity can cause other things too, like hot springs, geysers, um, fumaroles, and hydrothermal activity, which is where we get a lot of our hydrothermal gold, copper, and silver is in this way, and it actually forms very beautifully. So let's take a look at each of these videos. Let's start with hot springs. So, oh, sorry. This is a geyser. My apologies. So this is a geyser. Um, what it is, is you have a lot of hot water, so you get this water that gets turned into steam and it just throws out uh, steam and water. Not some place you want to stand near, but these are also hot springs that we have here. All this is hot water, and you can see it right here bubbling away. This is from Yellowstone National Park. Totally recommend visiting this place. Super cool. Let's try geysers. Alright, so right here is a hot spring that we can see. Uh, the color actually comes from a type of bacteria that lives in it called an extremophile, which is pretty cool. Alright, this is a geyser. This is Old Faithful, and you can kind of see how it has a lot of steam and super heated water gets shot out. Um, again, this is extremely hot. There's a lot of water vapor here. It will scald you, not a place you actually want to be standing is why they have barriers trying to protect you from it. And then you have fumaroles. 
Uh, fumaroles, again, are the vents with gas coming out, and that's it. This is um, actually places uh, a lot of scientists like this for scientists who study the gases that come out of volcanoes, which is neat. Um, this is also in Iceland. Again, Iceland has a ton of volcanoes. It's super cool. But all these fum fumaroles are little vents where gas is escaping from the volcano. And it could be water vapor. It could be sulfur dioxide. It could be carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Right, and the last one is hydrothermal activity, which we see right there. It's pretty neat. All right, and that is our lecture for today. I hope you all learned something, had some fun with it. If you had trouble finding some of the answers to the study guide today, um, either rewatch through this, take a double check at the um, PDF version of this. You might be able to find some of them. Otherwise, go ahead, post your questions in the Q&A for part one, and you should be able to get an answer relatively quickly. Remember, I check that often, and I try to get back to you guys, um, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening.